What if the threat of nuclear war becomes a reality? Do you know how to take care of your family and those you love? Hey, Provident Preppers, I'm Jonathan. And I'm Kyleen. And as the threat of a nuclear war becomes a terrifying reality, there are things that we can do to protect ourselves and our family from dangerous radioactive fallout. So today we're interviewing with Jay Wimpy. He is the president of the American Civil Defense Association and also the Civil Defense Volunteers of Utah. And he is providing us some really great information about expedient sheltering. Now, hopefully you're going to take some steps in advance. You're gonna think about this and have a plan, but whether you do that or not, these are things that you can do quickly to make sure that you protect your family. Right, just using things that you normally have in your home, like a table and a door and food storage or books. So this is really important. So just in case the world takes crazy to an entirely new level, these are things that you can do to be ready and protect yourself and your family from that dangerous radioactive fallout. We're also going to leave a link in the description of this video to a few resources that we think belong in every prepper library so that when something happens, you've got this and you can pull it out and you have a ready reference. So I hope that you enjoy our interview with Jay. He's a really great guy. Hey, Provider Preppers, we are excited today. We have Jay Wimpy with us. He is an expert on a myriad, well, the whole gamut of preparedness, but we're talking especially about nuclear preparedness today, and he is an expert on that. We're excited to have him with us. Um, so mom is going to read a bio and hey. tell you all about Jay. So I have to tell you, we have known Jay for years. We have been really good friends with him. And when I used to edit the Journal of Civil Defense, um, he's the one that got me into all this trouble, right? <laughs> and, and doing all of this. And it's, it's been fantastic to rub shoulders with him and to learn from him. But um, I'm just wanting to read his bio real quick so you know who he is and what he does. So J.R. Wimpy is the current president of the Civil Defense Volunteers of Utah. The organization conducts, conducts monthly training seminars in Salt Lake City and surrounding areas and provides information and radiation detection equipment like this to citizens interested in civil defense issues. He has prepared several articles on civil defense and preparedness topics and has compiled a fairly comprehensive civil defense guidebook. You have to show him this guidebook. Okay, that it's pretty impressive. It's one of our little go-to resources. Jay has been interested in civil defense issues for many years and has been a member of the Civil Defense Volunteers of Utah for over 15 years. He has served as its president for the past six years. Um, Jay received a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from the University of Utah in 1982 and a Professional in Engineering License in 1995. And you've also been president of the American Civil Defense Association, right? Yeah. So Yes, I'm, I'm the current president, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so. he's been a friend of mine for about 35 years now. I'm trying to think back when that exactly started, but probably 35 years ago. Jay and I, I started learning from Jay. Let's put it that way. And uh, he has been a great teacher for thousands. So, uh, so we're really looking forward to today because today you are going to learn a lot of really good information that may be super important for your immediate future. So Jay, why don't you go ahead and tell us what it is that you see in the horizon right now that makes it so that we should be concerned about some type of a nuclear event? Well, you know, I, I don't hate to overstate things, but um, I think we're closer to a nuclear war than we've ever been, you know, perhaps since the the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis or something of that nature. Uh, we have world leaders just dis openly discussing, making very thinly veiled threats that uh, they may or, or, you know, they, they may news use nuclear weapons. So uh, I think um, we are very close to, uh, you know, uh, facing that possibility in the very near future. Uh, uh, the situation in Ukraine has uh, uh, definitely brought that to a head and, and uh, you know, any uh, world power or uh, a country like Russia that feels like it's world power, if they're threatened and not being successful in what they want to do, 
they could easily um, just decide that they don't have a lot to use by uh, uh, using nuclear weapons. And uh, and then I think our current political leadership would also, um, they seem more inclined to uh, make threats and also perhaps follow through and, uh, and uh, use some of our nuclear weapons as well in retaliation. In fact, the, the leader of Ukraine, he was actually calling on the United States to um, uh, use nuclear weapons and maybe even make a preemptive strike. So, uh, and uh, the, the leadership doesn't seem to be very measured in, uh, in their speech and in their actions these days. So I'm, um, I'm concerned. Uh, enough to, you know, keep me close to home and keep me from, you know, traveling worldwide. So, uh, and, and then uh, making sure all my preparations are uh, uh, up to date and, and where I want them to be. So anyway, uh, th there is legitimate reason to be concerned. And I would say uh, it's very important to know what to do in order to prevent panic. You know, as long as we know uh, what to do, what's coming and what to expect. And, and if we've, uh, uh, thought of these things in advance, then rather than going into a panic mode and uh, then we can uh, actually make some uh, positive actions uh, or take some positive actions that will help us um, survive, help us and our families. Um, you know, I'm uh, reminded of the, um, a few years ago when uh, uh, Korea or North Korea was launching some missiles towards Hawaii and people were trying to crawl in storm drains and things of that nature. There, there was some large scale panic. And, and I think we need to, um, uh, consider the, uh, the real threat and some positive actions that we can take in order to, uh, mitigate that threat. So, um, yes, uh, and hopefully I, what we're, uh, we can visit about today. Yes. Along those lines, I have a quote that I, uh, try and look at frequently because it, uh, it's by Dr. Edward Teller, uh, who was the father of the hydrogen bomb. And he says, in the most dangerous situation, we have chosen the most da dangerous of courses. We have chosen not to face our danger. I think uh, that that is so true today. And he goes on to say, perhaps one of the most common misconceptions among Americans is that if a major wide-scale nuclear, biological, or chemical disaster strikes, chances of survival would be extremely low. In, real, in reality, however, this couldn't be further from the truth. Many and probably most will survive and most will not be prepared. There are many dangerous threats that do exist. However, for each threat, there are practical preparedness solutions that exist as well. I think that quote really sums it up. I think there are some, some difficult threats out there, but there's things that we can do about those. And uh, that's why we wanna to talk to you today. Absolutely. So let's let's get started with this. Exactly what kind of steps can we take now to prepare to be safe when some type of nuclear event occurs? Uh, first of all, we, uh, you know, in a nuclear event, um, uh, we're going to have to have uh, supplies, I guess, uh, in order to survive for quite some time. Uh, hopefully everyone that's interested, uh, that's, you know, interested in this uh uh, program would have a, a legitimate food storage. And so we have to get all of our supplies because uh, in, in a nuclear event, we may face a situation where we're going to have to uh, uh, be sequestered in a relatively small space for roughly um, a month or better. And so we, we need to have food, water, uh, sanitation supplies, and, and some bedding and such in order to make ourselves uh, uh, livable, I guess, uh, and, uh, or, you know, create a livable situation, uh, that we can, uh, uh, we can survive in whatever space that we want. Uh, we should be thinking about, um, well, uh, let me see. Uh, it, it would be good to have, um, uh, radiation detection equipment. I've, uh, I, I looked on the internet just the other day. Uh, we've, uh, kind of, uh, we were distributing, uh, radiation detection equipment in the um, uh, Utah Civil Defense Volunteers uh, organization for quite some time. However, we've kind of uh, run out of that now, but there are some meters around. I've got to admit um, some sources like, uh, oh, uh, Cheaper Than Dirt or or uh, Sportsman's Guide and uh, some places like that, they sell uh, some meters. However, I haven't had very good luck with them. 
especially the ones that have the remote sensing unit. And so uh, it, it might be good just to go on Amazon on the commercial market. Uh, there's radiation detection equipment uh, as low as $70, $80. Um, nuclear war survival skills is uh, uh, actually uh, has a, instructions on how to prepare uh, a, a a dosimeter based on uh, well uh, using commonly available materials and um, and that can be done you know if uh, you could probably uh, put that together in a, in a day or so uh, and that includes gathering the materials and that that would um, another thing is it, it's it is good to have um, good solid information and uh, I can't recommend highly enough the uh, the book, The Journal of Civil Defense. I know, Jonathan, you had a copy there. I don't have my copy right at hand, but... Um, um, it's there, what are we talking about? The, um, oh, the Journal of Civil... Okay. And, and uh, yeah, I meant to say the right. uh, Nuclear War Survival okay. Skills. Basically, this was... Uh, the Nuclear War Survival Skills book was put together uh, by uh, some very conscientious people that were just uh, interested in helping people survive a nuclear war. Uh, they had access to the open air testing that was done in Southern Nevada uh, way back when. So they, they can recommend some sheltering. Uh, and there's some great material in there about um, uh, expedient, uh, well, radiation meters, expedient cold weather clothing, expedient shelters, and uh, uh, food storage, water storage, water filtration, uh, all, all sorts of things. You know, it's, uh, I've got to admit, I ran into that book in, um, I think it was roughly 1989 or something like that. And, uh, you know, I had a, before that, I had a few, um, uh, a few old civil defense uh, pamphlets and, you know, I kind of hung on to those and I thought, ooh, that, that uh, I'm going to need to know that someday. But when I found nuclear war survival skills book, all my, uh, all my dreams of uh, having good, solid uh, scientific information about how to survive were answered. And uh, I've just <laughs> been with it ever since. So hey, you know, James, I, I think maybe we should back up for just a second because a lot of our viewers don't have all the years of experience um, learning about this that we do. And so let's stop for just a second and say, okay, if there was a nuclear device that, that was detonated, right? What does that mean to me? How, what does it mean to me? Um, Cause we just take for granted that you know that there's radiation, right? And that there's dust particles and, and all this good stuff. But let's let's bring it down and let's actually talk about what happens and why people would need to stay inside and why they would need to stay inside for a certain period of time. Okay, um, yeah, uh, nuclear weapons effects. Uh, of course, there's the uh, the heat and uh, and and radiation. Uh, basically, uh, you know, it's just a a lot of energy is released in a very small area uh, in a nuclear weapon, and so you know if you're uh, if your skin is exposed uh, to that, even 10 miles away, uh, you would uh, receive severe burns. And, uh, uh, and so we have to be protected from that in the, in the first place. Other than that, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a shock wave associated with that. A lot of physical destruction, breaking windows, knocking down buildings and that again, out to the 10, 15 mile range. And, um, and then uh, there is the residual radiation. Uh, the um, a, a ground burst uh, of a nuclear weapon is much more messy. Uh, it uh, sucks up a lot of um, of the local material and uh, can make that radioactive. And so, and then that gets distributed downwind uh, for sometimes hundreds of miles. And so, we have to be prepared for that. Uh, sometime, well, I guess uh, depending on what type of attack, you know, it could just be a uh, a small loop going off in the middle of a city that somebody smuggled in there, or, you know, if it's a strategic or, um, uh, yeah, strategic weapon uh, delivered, it would usually be targeted at a military target. And so an air force base or uh, some sort of military installation. And uh, we have to be conscious of our uh, position uh, to some of these facilities. Uh, you know, uh, they, Recently, in the last five or six years, they they actually lengthened and strengthened the runway at the Brigham City Airport. And so, you know, I'm I'm ten miles from the Brigham City Airport, and I'm about ten or fifteen miles north of Hill Air Force Hill Air Force Base. So I I live between two nuclear uh, 
targets. Uh, when they when they strengthen those um, uh, runways, uh, it makes them uh, usable for strategic bombers and such. And so, um, you know, they could potentially use that. And that would actually, in a in a war planning situation, that would um, that makes that a target because they would want to destroy that runway, which would require a ground burst. So, um, so if I case, understand this, this right, because you live so close, you live within 10 miles, you, you not only have, so you have the initial impact of the bomb that, that could definitely hurt you, right? You have the heat and the pressure wave. Yes. Right. And so you've got to make sure that you have a place to go. That's more hardened, but say you live down in Southern Utah. Say you're a couple hundred miles away. What do people that are that far away from the location need to be concerned about? Yes, even, well, yeah, uh, most people are not going to be in a blast zone. And so, uh, the, you know, their main main concern is going to be fallout. Uh, fallout is uh, a dust, but it's usually a relatively heavy dust. Um, the, the, the material that gets sucked up is in... Uh, uh, involved with a lot of heat, and so that particles tend to aggregate and, uh, and you know, make little, you know, droplets, basically, of material that ends up cooling down and, and creating a dust, but it's, it's relatively um, um, large particles, so it's not, not usually a very fine dust, but because of the thermal uh, updraft associated with the, uh, the weapons, uh, those uh, materials can be lifted up, you know, tens of thousands of feet in the atmosphere, and then they can be deposited, like we said, up to hundreds of um, miles downrange. So, um, and in in cases like that, you know, we could actually see environments where there are um, maybe uh, thousands of, or the environment would provide thousands of radiation actual doses to to people, and um, and about 600 kills you. And so, you know, potentially you could be in an environment where if you are exposed, you could be, um, you could receive a lethal dose uh, within less than an hour. And so, you know, that there is a legitimate concern there. So ha having a, some sort of a meter that uh, tells you that, or, or if you actually see dust coming out of the air, you know there's been a nuclear event and you see some uh, dust being deposited uh, just kind of coming out of the air, then uh, then you know that there would be a high probability, you know, that that dust could be um, radioact radioactive, and you sh should seek shelter. Um, first of all, well, I guess uh, you know uh, we should have all of our supplies ready to go and and be organized, and that that is a real bugaboo. I'm sure all of you. Um, uh, have gone on a camping trip or even, uh, you know, traveled or whatever. And then, you know, all of a sudden you're trying to gather up everything that you need for the trip or for camping and things like that. And it seems to take a long time, yeah, <laughs> or, you know, it think about it, sometimes, sometimes it's like days. And so it, it would be an important, important in an event like that to have everything pretty well ready to go. Um, and in one place, uh, you know, just all, all your food, water and portable containers and, um, you know, some uh, sleeping stuff or whatever, and uh, um, have all that stuff ready to go in case you needed to go somewhere or have it available in an area in your house where, you know, you could access it very quickly. Uh, you know, probably most people would um, be looking at a home shelter and uh, and our, our houses do provide a fair amount of, of protection. I'm sure you've probably seen uh, little signs, you know, the, the little yellow and black signs uh, uh, for fallout shelters on some commercial buildings and schools and things like that. They, um, those buildings were designated as kind of a stopgap measure for um, uh, a place for people to shelter, but they only had to have a protection factor of 10 in order to qualify. So most buildings, especially commercial buildings, you know, would have a, a place. And, and I would say most homes would actually provide a, a, a quite a bit of shielding, but we just need to understand what the, um, um, well, uh, the, the, you know, the time distance and, and, and shielding from the, uh, radiation and what we would need. If we understand that, then, then we can, uh, find a place that will probably be suitable. So will First you explain all, that to me? Um, the time distance, yeah. really help me understand, like, I, yeah, help me understand, like I've never heard of it before. 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, the, the radioactivity uh, can be very strong, but it decays very quickly. Um, and so, you know, the earth does not become unlivable. It just becomes uh, dangerous for us to be out and exposed uh, for a, a period of time. The, the, um, there's a rule of sevens, basically, uh, that, uh, you know, from the initial radiation level, uh, within seven hours, uh, the, uh, the radiation go, uh, actually is decreased to roughly 10% of what it was initially. So that, but then we have to go, it, it's a, an exponential curve going down. And so we have to go seven times seven or 49 hours, if you want to say that, or you could just, uh, you know, say in two days, it goes down, uh, another 90% to only 10% of, of what that, uh, of what the seven hour level was. So it's one one hundredth of, of uh, what it was uh, initially. And then if you seven times the two days and go out to 14 days or two weeks, then um, the radiation goes down to um, one one thousandth of what it was. And, and that might be livable, uh, may may not, but you'd need a meter to determine, uh, but, um, the radiation goes goes down relatively quickly, so we don't only have to be sequestered for, you know, maybe a, a month or two in order to protect ourselves and uh, keep from uh, getting a dose of radiation that's going to make us sick or or uh, actually uh, kill us. Um, the next item is distance. Um, basically, you can think of uh, the radiation uh, and high energy radiation, gamma radiation, is something like a light. Uh, you know, you could you could think of all this dust emitting light, and uh, and you know that uh, light emitted from a flashlight actually diffuses relatively quickly. To where you know, if you're ten feet away, it's much brighter than if you're a hundred feet away, and it, it actually decays with the cube of the distance. And so, if um, if you're in an interior room in your house, um, and you can keep the um, that really radioactive dust at 20 or 30 feet away from you rather than being exposed to it directly, that's going to reduce that, you know, uh, I guess you could uh, consider it with the cube of the distance and the cube of, uh, of 30 is 900. So, you know, you'll receive one one thousandth or one nine hundredth, I guess, of the uh, radiation that you would outside if you're in your house and, uh, and 30 feet away uh, in, in all directions uh, from the dust. And, and so um, that's where distance really comes in. And, and uh, if you live in an apartment building, you know, uh, the Nuclear War Survival Skills book actually shows that the, the middle floors in a, uh, in a commercial building with multiple floors are better. And then the interior rooms uh, on those floors is better. So, uh, you know, the, the radioactive dust will be falling out or it'll be deposited on the roof of the building. It's also going to be deposited on the ground outside the building. And so if you live in a high rise, then basically the middle floors are better. Um, and then there's the, um, the shielding uh, aspect. Basically, if you can put enough mass in front of or between you and the radiation, then that, that is the shielding that um, uh, can actually um, substantially reduce the amount of radiation. And when we talk about shielding, we talk about having thicknesses. So if you have, um, uh, if, if there's a certain amount of radiation on, uh, you know, uh, located in the area, and if you have one inch of lead between you and the, um, and the radiation, it will cut that radiation in half. And uh, we, not anybody really has that much lead lying around, but we, we tend to, uh, we're much more familiar with concrete and dirt. Concrete has roughly a, um, a four inch having thickness and dirt has about a uh, five inch having thickness. So if we, um, if we have five inches of dirt between us and the radiation, it cuts in half. We add another five inches, it cuts it by half again, so it's only one quarter. And then if we had another five inches, then it uh, cuts it in half again, so it's only one eighth of what it was initially. And, and you can keep doing that. So if you can get a few feet of dirt between you and the, um, and the radiation, that's very helpful um in in reducing the uh, amount of radiation that you receive so um if say if you're in a in a house with a basement uh, the radiation is on the outside of the basement walls it's it tends to be 
um, you know, it's higher than the basement. So you're not going to receive any kind of radiation through the walls because there's only dirt on the other side and that's absorbing most of the radiation. And so if we can get into a basement with, uh, in an area where we have walls um, that are, uh, that have dirt on the other side, and if we can um, uh, pile a little bit of stuff on top of us, as in maybe some, um, uh, some water drums or some drums uh, full, of, uh, full of food storage, and we can place those around us and maybe make a, um, Oh, what would you say? Uh, what would you say? A little uh, uh, ninety-degree angle for the entrance. Then you you can use that material for shielding, and anything that you can um, uh, use. You know, water is actually quite dense and uh, and offers yeah. a fair yeah. amount of shielding. Uh, food storage, again, you know, it's uh, basically just a matter of how much mass. So if it's heavy, it works good. If it's light, it doesn't work very good. So you know, uh, books um cans food storage uh, you know furniture um or you know if, if all else fails you uh, just getting um, dirt from outside and you know putting in sandbags or whatever and, and putting that over the top but it's uh, since you already have food storage in the house it's uh, it's good to um, uh, use things like that in order to provide shielding um, so let me see if i if i get this it's really important that I put as much, so we're talking about the dust particles are the bad guys. And I want to put right. as much space and mass between me and the dust particles as physically possible to stay right. safe. What yes. happens What happens to me if I'm exposed to that? If I'm exposed to the radioactive dust? Well, uh, basically it's... Um... We call gamma radiation ionizing radiation. So, and your your body is made up of all sorts of uh, living tissue that's made up of cells, and uh, the radiation will um, uh, actually disrupt. It'll break chemical bonds, and so uh, once you receive so much radiation, then there are um, it, it breaks so many chemical bonds that say individual cells will start to die. And, uh, you know, they, they can't sustain themselves anymore because they've lost too many, you know, there's been too much disruption. It's almost like uh, being cooked, uh, you know, and uh, uh, you, you, you've received too, so much radiation that the tissue will die. And uh, there are, um, well, there's examples where people have had x-ray accidents and things like that. And uh, where, you know, they've uh, passed their hand uh, or, or even... It's just their hand went in front of a of a high energy beam of, of even X rays, and uh, that hand dies on the end of your arm. Basically, the the cells can't can't replace themselves, and so um, you know the tissue dies. Um, you know the classical thing is you basically start falling apart inside. You start uh, um, bleeding out of your orifices, and and all, and uh, you know you reach a point where your body just can't sustain itself, and and uh, and so you. Uh, you would die at that point if you received too much radiation. Um, this is not a time to go outside. This is not a good time to go outside, you know, especially initially. No sunshine. When, well, dust there, yeah. So, and, uh, you know, if you do have a dosimeter or a radiation meter, um, a lot of the, the, the civil defense dosimeters were, uh, uh, they were in 200 rad um, increments, or that, that was their scale. And so at 200 rads, basically, um, uh, most people won't, won't see a lot of effect, you know, in, uh, if it's a single event, you know, you, you see, receive up to 200 rads means, you know, maybe outside it's, uh, it's 20 rads. You, you're, um, you're getting, uh, you know, one rad inside or whatever, but at, at 200 hours or whatever, basically a week of that, if it doesn't, uh, if something doesn't change, you, you might feel a little bit of sickness, but you're not going to be seriously hurt. Um, if you double that, uh, 200 rads, then, uh, then a lot of people will feel sick. You know, you can, uh, uh, lose your hair, things of that nature. And then usually at about 600 rads, uh, you, um, uh, you will die. And, uh, uh, you don't die immediately. You know, some of the cells are still hanging on and things of that nature, but they can't replicate themselves. And so, uh, you know, death could take several weeks, even though you re have received a lethal dose of radiation. So uh, you, you just start getting sicker and sicker and finally you, you die. So that's... Um, Stay that inside. Is, 
Stay inside. Stay, inside. Stay, away, stay away from the dust. Uh, if somebody comes in from outside, has a lot of dust, you know, make sure they get cleaned off. You don't want them hauling a lot of dust inside. I, I was going to mention, you know, basements are ideal. Uh, a crawl space is is good. You could actually pile stuff on the floor above the crawl space in the area that you want to be shielded. Um, you know, put some stuff again, again around you, but uh, just get that between the you and the dust. And then if all else fails, an interior room. It seems like most houses have a hallway with bedrooms on either side. And so that hallway might actually be your best bet is uh, to just hang out in the hallway, you know, as far away as you can get from the exterior walls. Um, maybe pile some furniture there, some tables and such, and, and stack material on top of that table. And that's going to provide you uh, a little bit of shielding from the dust that comes out on the, uh, on the roof and such. So does that make sense? I think it yeah. does. Yeah. So this is something that people could actually at least be thinking about right now. This is something yeah. that you can make some plans for. You can start thinking, okay, where would we go and how could we shield ourselves? Um, so, so that's great. That's a good action item for, for our audience. Um, the next question is, okay, you're out 50 miles away in another city shopping, for example, what are you going to do? How, how do you deal with that? We typically call that expedient shelter, sheltering. You know, can you tell us a little bit about the kinds of things you'd want to look for or, or uh, be aware of? Uh, yes. Uh, um, you know, as long as you understand the, the time uh, distance and shielding, then you can kind of uh, uh, think about where might be a good place to, um, to shield yourself from uh, from the uh, radiation uh, uh, from the fallout, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, well, a lot of commercial buildings, even if you're in the mall, you know they they sometimes do have basements. They uh, tend to put a lot of utilities. There's pipe runs and things like that, and so you know you start looking around for doors that might might not uh, be used all that much, but would lead to a, a pipe chase. Um, uh, that's, that's largely in the ground, you know, those would work out really well. Uh, you know, uh, universities and, and, uh, other, you know, complexes of, of commercial buildings, they have pipes running back and forth and they, they usually choose to, to do that underground or even, you know, exceptionally large buildings or exceptionally tall buildings, you know, those, uh, again, the, the middle floors of the tall buildings or, or large buildings where uh, there's a lot of distance between you and the exterior walls, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, in the middle of a big box store, although the, you know, the roof isn't all that thick or whatever, then that, you know, that would work. And hopefully if they have a basement, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, parking structures are also very good and they're, they're always accessible basically. So that makes them nice, but they're, they are usually underground. They have substantial concrete uh, floors in them. And if you can get down past a few, uh, uh, below a few of those floors and you're quite a ways away and you have all that, you know, that several feet of concrete between you and the, and the uh, radioactive fallout, then that would also shield you uh, pretty much. And that would be um, something that you could uh, go to if you're in a car and you need to find a, a place, the, the basement of a parking structure uh, would be very helpful. Or that would be a good place to hang out for a while. And how long do you think we should stay there? I mean, I know it depends on how far away you are from it and or from the blast and all that good stuff. But what do you think? Well, a meter is very, very helpful. But um, um, well, just uh, if you do the calculation, if you do have a meter, you know, you would say, OK, I'm, uh, I'm receiving or the outside environment has uh, roughly one rad per hour. So we know. Uh, we're not going to be able to tolerate that. You know, if, if it has a half a rad per hour, you know, maybe you could uh, change places or whatever. If it's down in the tenths or hundreds of rads per hour, then all of a sudden it's not not a concern. But uh, you know, the first two weeks and maybe the first month is is fairly critical. After that, you know, it seems like you could uh, well, make a, a a choice or a, a, an educated guess. You know, do I do I stay here? Do I need to go? you know, find food and water, or do I need uh, to go out for a reason and other 
other than that, you know, you just stay put in a relatively sheltered area uh, for as long as you possibly can. You know, as long as your food and water hang out, then you then you just stay there uh, and uh, and enjoy your um, your relatively protected area. A little bit of solitude. Yeah, <laughs> and and it, it does take a while, and you know, uh, uh, heaven help you if you have young children. <laughs> that's. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> living cooped up with uh younger kids is uh, really kind of an interesting thing but uh you know if you can keep things kind of quiet and dark and do a lot of sleeping or whatever you know then time time goes by pretty easily or, or pretty pretty well i guess but it, it would uh you would tend to go a little bit stir crazy so what do you think the probability of surviving a nuclear event would be and is there any hope for a good life after one you know the yeah. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people. It's kind of funny. A lot of people say, I just want to die. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to run towards the blast. And I said, well, um, it's only going to work for about 10 or 15% of the population, even in a full scale attack. There's, there's uh, relatively few people that are going to be killed initially. A lot of people are killed, um, you know, with uh, radiation afterwards. Uh, you can look at the accounts of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, that, uh, a lot of people, you know, I think it was like 60, 70,000 died immediately from the blast effects. Uh, and then there were, they sent in a lot of rescue workers, and but there was enough radioactivity to where uh, many of them died of radiation sickness. And then, um, and so that's, that's kind of the, you know, the, the way it will work. But um, uh, the, it, it is um, the most lethal thing about um, a nuclear war is that all of our supply and sanitation uh, infrastructure goes away. So basically, if you don't have the food and, and uh, water and, and proper sanitation uh, materials, then, um, then you'll die from that. And more people will die of that uh, in, a, in a nuclear war than from the initial blast or probably even from the radiation. And uh, but there, there is hope for a good life after, you know, uh, uh, a year, a year down the road, the radiation would be very, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, very little concern. Uh, the, you know, they do talk about, you know, can you eat an animal that's been irradiated or whatever? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, um, strontium is radioactive and it uh, looks a little bit uh, like calcium from a, um, a chemical standpoint. And so they say you can eat the meat from a, uh, an animal that's even died from radiation, but you, uh, you should stay away from the bones. Uh, you should, uh, of course, try to stay away from anything that's directly contaminated with the dust. Um, anything that's in a can, food and such, even though it's been irradiated, it's safe. Um, we do the same thing when we cook it, basically. We break a lot of chemical bonds. And so anything that's sealed in a can is going to be safe to eat. Um, the water should be filtered thoroughly uh, so that you don't, uh, you don't want to get any of that dust inside of you because it just keeps uh, radiating and, and you don't have any, any shielding, especially when it's inside of you. Um, but um, you do... There, there's hope of a of a good life, but the infrastructure will have to be rebuilt, and and you'll have to have a substantial food storage and and the wherewithal to uh, purify water and, and that in order to be able to to survive uh, long term. And that's really what the the uh, American Civil Defense Association tries to do. Uh, the the Red Cross um, is very good at immediate uh, uh, disaster response. However, you know, they're, they're always even saying that, you know, stay, uh, hang on for a few weeks and then somebody will come and rescue you. But, uh, in a widespread nuclear event, uh, the, the rescuers are all going to be busy trying to survive themselves. And so you'll need, uh, you'll need a fair amount of food and, and, uh, capability in order to survive long-term, but, you know, society can be rebuilt and, um, um, you know, we have the knowledge in that, so it would be rebuilt a lot quicker. We wouldn't have to wait hundreds of years, but, uh, you know, uh, left alone after even a few years, things could actually uh, get back to uh, somewhat of a normal living situation where we're not directly threatened all the time. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. So did you say that you had a link for this book that it, you could get it online free? Is that what we were talking about? Yes. Yeah, I, I can send you that. 
Okay, so let me sum this up for our viewers, right? Um, first, I would get that resource so that you have, there's lots of really, really good information in there, but we need to recognize the threat, right? The first thing that we do is a risk assessment. So look and see what the targets are that are near you and what your risk is. Um, make sure that you have all the supplies in your home that you would need to be able to survive, I would say personally for a year, but for at least a month, a minimum of a month. And then I think a year is a really good option. If you travel a lot, make sure that you have the supplies that you need in your car in case you get caught in a parking garage and you have to hunker down for a while so that you can stay safe. And then really look at your situation and decide what can you do to put distance right? And shielding um, and shield yourself from those radioactive particles while you let the time pass so that you can be safe. Um, if you can get some of the really cool devices like this, that's great. Um, the American Civil Defense Association is a wonderful resource. They have something called the TACTA Academy that is open for everyone. It's completely free, right, Jay? Yes. The TACTA Academy. Um, and they also have, um, you can sign up to get the Journal of Civil Defense. You can get a hard copy mailed to you. If you do that, it costs money, but um, you can have a membership. Is the membership free? The membership and is access, free. And, and, and access. Uh, I would you can strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, yeah, all of the, uh, all the previous issues, all the past issues you can access and uh, download and distribute at will. It's not copyrighted. I, it's a wonderful wealth of information. And right now, information is what we really need to get. And, and we don't need the information that says in two weeks, somebody will come save you because there's not going to be somebody to be able to save us. We really have to be self-reliant, yeah. take care of ourselves and our neighbors, right? Make sure we understand who might need our help. And maybe there's somebody that would need to shelter in place with you so that they could be safe. Or maybe you can't shelter where you are and you need to have another place that you have very quick access to that that you can get to for instance if you don't have a basement but you have friends who are in your neighborhood who have a basement and that would be it'd be less boring if we could yep. get together and party a little bit right <laughs> i don't know sure. but so that's that's the takeaway that i take from this what do you think jay what final words do you have for our audience you know, the most important thing is is knowing what to do, you know, in any disaster situation, just knowing what to do. And if you know what to do, then uh, then there's much less need for panic. And uh, if you panic and uh, uh, you end up doing things that are counterproductive and uh, that won't save you. So if you think about these things, uh, inform yourself, uh, you know, just read the first few pages of uh, that uh, Nuclear War Survival Skills book is very helpful. And then, uh, then as you go, you can actually, at, you know, do a few little projects, you know, maybe, um, um, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, once you decide, uh, you know, what the details of your situation, as long as you understand the principles, then you will, um, uh, you can figure out what to do. You know, people, you need to have a lot more confidence in yourselves, uh, you know, just know that you, you can figure out a way to get some uh, distance and shielding uh, for your own personal situation and, and who you can work together with, you know, if it's a family project or things like that. In the Nuclear War Survival Skills book, uh, they actually did an experiment where a, um, uh, they took a couple of college girls uh, that uh, uh, wanted to, uh, well, they, they wanted to just see if they could build themselves a reasonable shelter uh, uh, given 24 hours notice. And they did, uh, basically, they, they dug a trench put a few planks over the top of the trench and took the dirt from the trench and put it back on top of the planks. And then they had a, basically a, a, a self-made tunnel that they could crawl down in. And, uh, and that provided, uh, you know, reasonable shielding uh, for uh, a, a fallout event. So anyway, you know, things can be done. And, and the, the book I would say is, is very useful and uh, that can help you out um, immensely. Speaking of which, Jay is actually going to do a second interview with us where he's going to talk about all kinds of do-it-yourself shelters, right? And we've actually been blessed to go on some tours of some real um, blast and fallout shelters um, with 
with Jay and, and um, the American Civil Defense Association. And there's some pretty impressive ones. We don't have one because our budget is this big. And sometimes you need a bigger budget. But Jay's got some fantastic ideas of ones that, you know, it's going to take a little bit of sweat equity and some resources, but you could do it for a lot less expensive if you were willing to do it. So we're going to do that video soon. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Jay. This has been wonderful. This has been a learning experience for our audience and for us. And uh, we just appreciate you spending some time with us today to talk about these very important issues and, and getting back to Edward Teller's Let's not ignore the threat here. The, the worst thing we can do is just pretend that it's not a real threat or that it's not going to happen. Um, take a little bit of effort, a little bit of thinking and risk analysis and decide what you can do to make a difference to secure your life for your family and your friends. Um, so we don't have to deal with the, the serious, really serious issues of life. Yeah. So get busy, right? Think about this in the comment section. For the question of the today, for the question of the day, we would love to hear what your plan is so that you and your family can survive a nuclear event. Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.